Listen carefully. This is the sound of a male beaver mourning its lost family after their dam was destroyed. It's probably the saddest recording I've ever heard coming from any uh, organism, human or other. Recording sounds of nature can tell us a lot about the environment. The way I explain it, it's very simple, just close your eyes. You know, humans are primates, we're visually fixated. Just, just turn that sense off. And then you get a real sense of this whole other world that, we, that surrounds us, but we don't take the time to acknowledge. There's a quiet revolution happening in the way that ecologists gather information. If you want to find out what lives here and how this ecosystem changes over time, then you'll need a team of ecologists armed with binoculars and traps working over years. But what if you could do the same with something strapped to this tree and an SD card? Small digital recorders with long-life batteries and plenty of memory are transforming the field of soundscape ecology. You're sleeping, you've gone home, it starts to rain, weird things are happening out in the field and they're ticking over, capturing that rare event. The technology allows scientists like Dave Watson to observe nature without disturbing it. Recorders are set up in arid environments to monitor what happens in big flood events. You can't get there during that time because we can't afford helicopters and the roads don't work when they're wet. We've got these sensors out there and with a solar panel and a charge regulator, it just ticks over for a year. And so the rains come, it greens up, the frogs go bananas, the birds appear, the birds breed, it keeps raining, they breed again. The green fades away, it gets dry and dusty, and you come back and get your SD card, and it's all there. Sound can also alert us to things we don't want, like the arrival of cane toads to islands of the top end. So we've got autonomous machines we put out there, and they switch on when they think they hear a cane toad, they record it. They send us an email and say, hey, human, I just recorded this, and you listen to it, and you go, no, it's a generator. Thank you, not a cane toad. Or, geez, that's a cane toad. Let's marshal the forces and get out there because they're not supposed to be there. For her PhD, Jessie Cappadonna hopes to find something that's gone missing. A small brown bird whose population numbers no more than 2,500. I'm looking for the eastern bristlebird. The eastern bristlebird is an endangered species, and it's really interesting because we're trying to see how we can engage citizens to look for this bird through the internet and help us find it, because there's so much data, there's absolutely no way a small team of ecologists can easily go through it, but we really want to figure out where the bird is. I actually had no idea what to look for initially, so what we did was deploy some monitors at the Corumban Wildlife Sanctuary. Hello, there it is. Yeah, that's the bird, and you'll see it's coming up again, and there's lots of variation in that call. So that's how we can learn about the diversity in the calls, and that's how I will be able to recognize calls in the wild now. <laughs> Eddie Game's workplace is a complete contrast. Of all the ecosystems that I've worked in, um, the Papua New Guinea forests are, are by far the most deafening from a natural point of view. In those forests, you have anywhere between 5 and 10% of all the species on the planet um, crammed into a lot less than 1% of the land area. In the remote Adelbert Mountains of PNG, his project gauges the impacts of subsistence farming to help landowners develop their own community plans to protect biodiversity. We've found somewhat remarkably that a forest 
even with a small bit of forest chopped down for garden, sounds really different to a forest that's intact. Basically, as soon as you start chopping some of the trees out of a forest, it changes that soundscape. And then this is the... It was surprising to us the extent of that effect. I'm gonna go to the spectrogram. And then you're going to be looking we have this kind of baseline signature now and we can go back and see over time how things change uh, both as an indication of how the forest is being used and what other natural background changes might be occurring as a result of climate change. This is what the soundscapes of the mountain jungles look like, but how to make sense of such complexity. Michael Towsey's specialty is turning all that sound into pictures. The standard way is with a spectrogram like this. The x-axis here is time in seconds and the y-axis is frequency. This would be a low frequency bird call here, middle frequency and these are high frequency components of bird calls up here. So you're really showing how acoustic energy varies over time? Yes, the uh, intensity of the black colour relates to the intensity of the acoustic energy. We can typically hear in an acoustic range that's from something like 20 hertz to about 20 kilohertz, 20,000 hertz. And if you think about every kilohertz as, as one band, a 1,000 hertz, and we think of the acoustic soundscape as all the energy that's in that spectrum, um, and that's how we analyse it. We sort of carve up that soundscape into one kilohertz band and work out how much energy is happening at any point in time in each of those bands. This way of looking at the world through sound was pioneered by Bernie Krauss. Push in the background. That's wolves. I'm certainly old enough to be the father of soundscape ecology. I don't know that I would call myself that. He introduced the idea of an acoustic niche. The acoustic niche hypothesis explains how animals in a given habitat all find niches and bandwidth in which to vocalize so that they stay out of each other's way. This is an insect over here. And then birds down here. And mammals down here. If their survival depends on their voices, then they have to find channels to vocalize that are clear. Otherwise, their voices are going to be masked by either other animals, other kinds of creatures. In a really intact landscape with all the species, all of those different frequencies are occupied by species speaking to each other at the, that frequency. And as we lose some of those species, we can pick that up in the loss of sound in some of those frequencies. Susan Fuller is using sound to compare different environments in bushland surrounded by outer suburban Brisbane. As anthropophony increases, human-generated noises, we uh, see a decrease in biophony. That's the biological sounds in the environment. And with that pattern, we can then start to evaluate the negative effects of humans on the ecosystems that we're studying. This research takes more than simply switching a microphone on. Recording all this sound for days on end creates millions of gigabytes of data. Getting the acoustic data is one thing, processing it is another. And that's where information technology comes in. Michael writes computer code to make the visual analysis of soundscapes possible. If a standard spectrogram is 30 seconds or a minute or so, what do you do when you want to have 24 hours or longer? Yes, well, that was the big challenge, of course, that we had to deal with. If you wanted to look at 24 hours of recording at the standard scale, you'd need a computer screen 1.2 kilometres wide. It's so compressed to fit a screen that all the details become blurred. Michael's lab has found a way to colour code the spectrograms using technology for decoding satellite data. 
It is the first time that it's been possible to view the acoustic structure of an entire day's uh, recording uh, with this resolution. It, it reveals a lot of information that ecologists would not have been able to see before. He's working with Susan to take these visualisations a step further. Comparing the soundscapes of a nearby creek with this paperbark forest led to an unexpected result, even though the birds in both are much the same. On a particular day that we recorded at both sites, same period of time, same day, and we see um, vastly different acoustic signatures. I have to confess that this is the first time I've actually been to this location. I knew from not listening to the recordings, but, but looking at my visualisations of them, I knew that there was something very different between these two locations. So what I tried was a technique that's not been used before with acoustic recordings, where I clustered the sound. Uh, what that does is it reveals different acoustic states. He transformed the spectrograms into these concentric squares that show distinctive patterns. This is from the creek, and this is from the forest. Each square represents changes in acoustic energy from the birds that's not visible in the spectrograms. Wow. Now, now I really see some differences, but I've never seen anything like this before. Well, I hadn't seen these until four days ago myself. I'm still coming to terms with what they mean. We're developing a new technique here, which is revealing things that we haven't seen before. And this is really important information because it can provide a trigger for us as ecologists to say, OK, there's something going on at this site and maybe we should go and, and sort of try and work out what, what's changed that pattern between those areas. How soundscapes change over time is where this research could be most valuable and disturbing. Soundscapes are a narrative of place, and within that narrative, there are lots of stories being told about how well we're doing in relationship to those uh, habitats. 50% of my archive, and I've got about 5,000 hours of soundscape recordings and about 15,000 creatures, about 50% of my archive comes from habitats that no longer exist in any form. Either the habitats are altogether silent or the um, soundscape is so radically altered that you can't hear it in any of its original form any longer. Last year was the first silent spring I've ever heard in my 77 years on this planet. And if we still that voice any further than what we're doing right now, we're really losing a great opportunity uh, to find our relationship to the rest of the creature world of which we're very much a part. Next week on Catalyst, Stormageddon. How are storms changing as the world warms? The storm wave event was, was so unique because it was, it was a black nor'easter combined with an east coast low. They produced the most extreme storm wave environment and orangutans, teaching us a thing or two about computer games. Connect with Catalyst on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube and our website.